Welcome to the Ministerial Research Institute of the International Missionary Society Seventh-day Adventist Church Reform Movement. Today, we review Sabbath School Lesson number 22 for November 25, 2023, Workers in the Vineyard. With us in our online studio is Pastor Joel Nazareno Barneo. Welcome to our program, Brother Barneo. Good morning, Brother Larry, and good morning to all our brethren around the world. Thank you for being with us. It's a great pleasure and joy to study the lesson together, Workers in the Vineyard. Let us begin with a, with a prayer for the blessing and guidance of heaven. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. That we might have your Holy Spirit, that you will speak to us, that our lips will speak only that which is true and right before you, the throne and God of heaven. We thank you now for those who have prepared these lessons and for those who are helping us present them and for those who are taking the time to study it and watch this presentation. Bless their families, their churches, and may this promote a spiritual understanding uh, and a real uh, con concept of what Jesus is trying to say in this lesson, especially for the workers around the world. And we ask now that your church may be blessed by your presence and through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So it's a great pleasure that you've, a joy that you've joined us today to study this lesson the workers in the vineyard. It's from Christ's Object Lessons, chapter 28, and it's the next to last chapter in that very beautiful book. And the title of that chapter is The Reward of Grace. And that begins, the chapter begins with these words. The truth of God, the truth of God's free grace had been almost lost sight of by the Jews. The rabbis thought that God's favor must be earned, the reward of the righteous they hope to gain by their own works. Thus, the worship was pro promoted a grasping mercenary spirit. From this spirit, even the disciples of Christ were not wholly free. So the parable of the workers in the vineyard follows Christ's encounter with the rich young ruler, which was followed by his comment that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, some have taken that thought and said that there was a gate into Jerusalem called the eye of a, of a needle. But there's no proof of that. But what Jesus is saying, it's impossible for us to carry anything from this world even our own good works, as a reason for us to be saved. Peter then makes a statement and a question, and this is the center of the lesson. Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have, therefore? From this mercenary spirit, even the disciples of Christ were not wholly free. And the Savior saw every opportunity of showing them their error. The encounter with the rich young ruler and Peter's question, what shall we have, opens the way for him to present the right principles. So what are those right principles? We'd like to point out that in order to understand this lesson, we need to be sure that we are coming at it from the right point of view. There is a promise that God gives to Peter's question. And a proper understanding of the saying of the first shall be last and the last shall be first is important for a correct understanding of this lesson. If the last are understood to still being in the kingdom, then the parable will not be properly understood. So I'd like to uh, make a short little dissertation about this point. If the denarius is Christ himself, which some have proposed, then the parable says that the end of all workers will be alike. 
no matter whether some are mercenary or murmur when they receive their pay. We have the same result when the denarius is thought to be and being the image of God, which some others have also taught. Thus, this view leads those who interpret this um, parable about the first and last, or the, to interpret the words that the first come last only by receiving a rebuke, and the last come first by receiving no rebuke. Then Jesus should have said, thus there will be neither first nor last, but all will be alike. And that's not what he says. How can anyone who has Christ, the divine image or eternal life, murmur in the end? What we can say then, as we search this um, study, is that the denarius means something else. Luther himself had not the idea or an idea what the denarius was. He refused to comment on it. Melanchthon, his helper, also made some very interesting and I think important observations. He said the denarius stands for the temporal blessings and that the life eternal is, comes from the good master. So the laborers who regard themselves first receive only the former, that is, natural blessings, while those who are working for whatever the master wants to pay are working for the spiritual rewards. So Peter's question, what shall we have, therefore, had revealed a spirit that uncorrected would unfit the disciples to be messengers of Christ. For it was the spirit of a hireling. While they had been attracted by the love of Jesus, the disciples were not wholly free from Phariseeism. They still worked with the thought of meriting a reward in proportion to their labor. They cherished a spirit of self-exaltation and a spirit of complacency and made comparisons among themselves. When one of them failed in any particular, the others indulged feelings of supremacy. And that is the first paragraph of our lesson. We fail to mention the introduction, which has to do with the context. It says, for the bride, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So now we come into the meat and body of the lesson with this background understanding that the great harvest and few workers, then the mixed feelings, and then the third part, the divine principle versus human tendencies. So as we look at the lesson, let's consider what it's pointing out in the first question. Brother Barneda, would you help us then with question number one? Uh, good, uh, good morning again, and uh... The, the title of our subtitle is The Great Harvest and Few Laborers. So we see here that uh, the question says, In the parable of the laborers, at what time of day did the householder call for people to work in his vineyard? You know, when I was living in Bronx, New York, if you need a laborer, if you need a carpenter, if you need anything, any help, you will go to the gasoline station and there are there are people there who have their own, uh, who are carpenters or mechanic, but you need to go there very early in the morning. And they will come to you and they will ask, do you need any laborer, sir? Do you need any helper? But you need to to wake up early to get the uh, the best of the carpenter. So here it says in the parable of the laborers, at what time? It was very early uh, in the morning when the Bible says uh, the when the fullness of the time came. So God sent His Son. So He is the 
he is the householder and he needs yaro laborers missionaries they he needs youth he needs a uh, good samaritan uh, young people from our church and the field is the world and the world is waiting for us to bring them the good news so it says here very early in the morning the householder called for people to work in his vineyard and what was so significant about the question that he asked at the 11th hour why stand ye here all the day idle so god needs uh, our our service and we need to work for the lord and it says here that the householder went very early then also at the third hour that is around nine o'clock and then he went again at 12 o'clock he went again outside to look for more because the harvest is already ripe and so at three o'clock but then at the 11th hour at five o'clock he went out and he asked them why are you standing here on the 11th hour and uh they they said that no one hired us because no man hired us. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that ye shall ye receive. So everyone has the privilege to be employed by heaven. So, Brother Larry, back to you. For that explanation, Brother Joel. And I like your illustration of the gas station. That's really nice. Because I'm sure they had uh, certain kinds of things back then um, where they met and they knew where that was. So the spirit that God desires them to labor for him is not the spirit of mercenaries. And this is what the whole lesson is about. So those who are hired at the earliest hour agree to work with a stated sum. Those hired later leave their wages to the discretion of the householder. So one's made a signed contract. You're going to pay me this amount. And the other said, we'll take whatever we can get. So the question is the second main question of the lesson. Okay. Why did those who were hired first not understand the grace that was granted to those who were hired last? Now, this question is answered in question four and in question six. But here, it, we begin the understanding of what's going on. Whatsoever is right, I will give you, is what the, the householder said. That, that householder is God himself, actually, who has offered us grace through Jesus Christ. So, when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith to the steward, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. So God has made the, the contract with uh, those who have stipulated what they were going to get. So question three, four, six, and seven. Uh, and the last note um, of question five is the first and main question to be considered. And that is, what is going to be our pay? Romans 4 Verses 3 and 4, particularly 4, says, What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's quoting back to even Genesis chapter 12. And it also was repeated in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, that it was by grace. And now Paul is pointing out that that promise came 400 years or more before the law. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And some translations end it with, as something owed to them. So in the parable, the first laborers agree for a stipulated sum. And the others who were hired later said, whatsoever is right, we shall receive. So they showed the confidence in him by asking no question regarding their wages. They trusted to his justice and equity. They were rewarded, not according to the amount of their labor, but according to the generosity of his purpose. That it is with 
Thus it is with the sinner. It says, his time of service seems so short, he feels that he is undeserving of the reward, the works of the humble, trusting spirit, thankful for the privilege of being a co-worker of Christ. This spirit God delights to honor. So when we think about how much we've worked, no matter if we've worked 50 years for God, it's such a small amount that it's, not, it's infant, it's so small. It's like thinking about this earth in the vastness of the universe. That's how small it is. It's a speck. It's a rock in the floating in space. It's a very small thing, but it's the generosity of God that we know that he is just in all things. So what is our motive? How do we go about it? What is our feelings when others are um, seemingly rewarded above us? What do you think, Brother Joel? Question three deals with that. Yeah, the, the subtitle is mixed feeling. Uh, many times I, I, I spoke to pioneers of the work in different uh, area of the world. And they told me in the beginning, we started the work. We don't have a church. We don't have even a bicycle. We don't have money. But at last, we finished this temple. And we brought a lot of souls. So sometimes when they retired, they said they never treated us well. Uh, they did not see the sacrifices we did for the pioneering work. And so the same thing with this. What did the first day laborers think of this? And what did they say? Uh, what divine counsel applied at the time of Jesus is also applicable to us today. We can commit the mistake that when we as workers started the work, we want the praise, we want appreciation, and the other one, he's just newly arrived he started the work now he has now a better life than me what kind of organization is this so but when the first came and they supposed that they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny and when they when he saw they saw that the last one who just worked for one hour was uh, received the same thing as the pay as he is uh, they begin to more more. They said only one hour. I came and gave Bible study, and he just baptized the souls that I was preparing. Now he got the glory. So, but the Bible says in Philippians, do all things without murmuring. The one who who op uh, who prepared the ground, the one who put the seed, the one who watered the plant, and then. Three of the one who did it first, maybe they were transferred, and the one came very new, he harvested. But this is the human nature, my dear brothers and sister. It's it says in the in the uh did they bring into their work a loving, trusting spirit? No matter what how much you do, but how much love you do it for Christ. They would continue first, but their careless complaining disposition is unchristlike and proves them to be untrustworthy. Okay, they work for almost 12 hours. It reveals their desire for self-advancement, their distrust of God, their jealous, grudging spirit toward their brethren. And so, but when the Lord's goodness was shown, his liberality, they made thus an occasion of murmuring. Thus, they show that there is no connection between their soul and God. So may we not uh, commit the same mistake. Let's prepare others to continue the work. Then we will have less uh, jealousy because when we have one gift, we double we double it by training others to continue the work then even though we retire or go away from the work or rest the others will continue the work but at the, when jesus comes we will have the same reward 
reward of the crown of life that is given to all those who have made sacrifices. Yes, God is taught, taught, teaching us here that we don't need to have an entitlement uh, mentality. And that word is used several times entitled uh, in the lesson. And that's what is fostered in the world today, that spirit of entitlement. But it must not enter into the work. What did the householder recognize that those who were hired first did not see? Unlike the former, how did the latter react to what they received? The former react in a way that when every man received a penny, they, they thought, well, you are making them like us. How can that be? Thou hast made them equal to us, it says. But here we are to understand that when they came and were hired at the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. So what this penny represents, at least according to Melanchthon, and I think he's right, as we mentioned earlier, is we all receive the blessings of heaven. Christ said in his parable, in his Sermon on the Mount, in regard to the blessings of heaven, God lets his rain and his sunshine shine on the good and the bad. We've all been blessed with talents, with abilities. We all have this these gifts of God. What are we doing with them? But the eternal life is comes from God. It's not earned by anything we do. Um, Romans, of course, points this out. Every Even so, then, at the present time, there's also a remnant according to the election of grace. And by grace, then, it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But it, if it be of works, then is it no more grace. But otherwise, works, work is no more work. Another translation says, For if we are saved by our own works, it can no longer be salvation by grace. So, we find here that not the amount of labor um, about, or the visible results, but the spirit in which the work is done makes it of value with God. And I like what Brother Joel just said. It's the amount of love, not the amount of work that really counts. So their hearts were full of gratitude to the one who had accepted them and when at the close of the day the householder paid them for a full day's work, they were greatly surprised. You know, Sister White makes it plain that when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised. We're going to be surprised mostly by the fact that if we're there, we're there. So they never forgot the goodness of the householder and of the generous compensation they had received. But the others did what? They murmured and complained. You know, if you look at the, uh, the 144,000, there's one of the sons of Israel that's not there, and it's Dan. Dan is not mentioned in the 144,000. He was a complainer and a murmurer. And that seems to be a sin above all others, according to what we see there. So what divine principle uh, versus human tendencies are we talking about here, Brother Joel, with question five and what follows? Yeah, divine principles versus human tendencies in missionary outreach. What does God desire from his people? What did the parable teach concerning the principle of love that God exercised? You know, when when a person who is a sinner and who were one time blind uh, met Jesus and Jesus begins to open his eyes and see himself and he saw, saw himself as a sinner and he cannot even look like the publican to Jesus and when Jesus forgave him he went home not bragging not a pharisaical spirit but he knew that he was living by his grace alone if the Lord did not did not uh, forgive him he would have stayed crazy with all this uh, bad conscience, but now he is free. Now he goes out and read the Bible and he appreciates and he applied it to himself. 
not applying to judge others, but now he is ready now to look for people who are in the same situation as he was. And then now he goes there without boasting or merit in his in himself. And then he is now a wise man who, who don't glory in not in his own wisdom, neither on his own mighty mighty might, uh, but he glorieth only because he knows me that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. Then he will go out, save souls. He will pray with sincerity. He will not be in a hurry, but he will reach the heart as God reaches in his heart. So this is the principle of love. Principle of love. Not a hireling where a little bit offense, a little bit offended. I want to resign from this kind of work. That shows that he, was, he never appreciated the salvation of the Lord that was imparted or given to him. That's a wonderful quote there and, and a note, uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. It reminds us clearly that to know God and whom who he has sent, that is eternal life. That's what that verse says. And the other quote is, of course, in John 17, 3. And why were all the laborers called to work for the Lord? the Lord's vineyard. At the end of time, how will the Lord reward both the sower and the reapers? Again, I'm reminded of that chapter in um, Amos chapter 9, verse this time verse 13, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and the hills shall melt. So this text tells us that at the end of time, everything is going to be going on. The Holy Spirit is going to be working in different ways and different purposes. Reminds me of what Paul was saying in, in Corinthians, that some people were saying, I was baptized by uh, this person or that person. Paul says, I don't remember who I baptized. It doesn't matter. What matters is Christ. That's what matters. It's not who gets the glory. Uh, I think it was President Truman who said, it's amazing what it can get done when no one cares who gets the glory. I think Ronald Reagan quoted that as well. Um, and that's where we need to be. We need to do our part and leave the rest with God. So it tells us in Mark chapter 10 that, and Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sister or father or mother and so forth that will not receive reward in this life and the world to come. So God said that, Jesus said that, to the disciples. And it's interesting that then he went on to tell this parable about what was going on really in the situation. Because question five goes back to what we started to say at the beginning of the lesson. It points the context of this lesson that it is not what we reward, we are rewarded, but God has promised a great reward. But that's not the important thing. We shouldn't work for that. We should work because it's a privilege to work with Christ, to have the spirit of Christ. And as it reads also in the note here, it, that the long years of service they regarded as entitling them to receive a larger reward than others. So we should never worry about what people get because remember the parable of the talents. Some received more than others. But those who receive more are accountable more. So if we receive less, whatever we receive, let's be faithful in that which we have. Because he who is faithful in a little shall be faithful also in much. And it tells us that him who has shall be given. But him who complains and has not shall be taken away, even that which he has. So now we come to the last question in our lesson, in the parable, and it goes back to Matthew 15. What's going on here in the last question, Brother Joel? Yes, the question was the woman. Uh, he turned from the tradition of the Judaism to the principle of true Christianity by asking Jesus for crumbs from heaven. So this woman came 
and worship Jesus saying, Lord, help me. Please help me, Lord. But Jesus answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. So he felt a little bit hurt, insulted. But uh, because he came to Jesus with a desire for help. So no matter how painful the answer was from Jesus, he just had patience. And she said, and I like this very much, my dear brothers and sisters, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crops which fall from their master's table. So, you know, God came not for one particular people. For God so loved the world. Anybody inside the world is included in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this first group who were hired earlier, they should have helped to look for workers. They should have enjoyed that even any kind of people surrounding Jerusalem should be called and receive an opportunity to know the gospel. And But they, they tried to to put walls, make it higher so that they don't want to deal with the, with the Gentile world. They look at them as like dogs. Jesus was trying to, to let the disciples hear how what is in their heart that they treat the, 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 the hidden world as dogs, uh, not worthy to even uh, receive Jesus as a visitor. And they were listening. You know, because Jesus was trying to unfold the deep mysteries of the truth and uh, which have been hidden for ages that the Gentiles should also uh, be fellow heirs with the Jews. So my dear brothers and sisters, uh, according, according to the note, now Jesus brought the disciples in contact with the hidden whom they regarded as having no reason above their people to expect from him. He would give an example of how such a one should be treated. The disciples had thought that he dispensed too freely the gifts of his grace. He would show that his love was not to be circumscribed to race or nation. So a lesson for us, my dear brothers and sisters, that we as member of the church we should not look at people through our own eyes but we need to look through the eyes of jesus christ you know i was sick and you visited me we don't ask people if they are affiliated with a group of religion our work is to bring them in a loving way not through debate not through discussion, not to trying to bully them and putting them down, but our work is to be to reveal the mercy and the love of God through them. So I have seen in my experience that people come to the church not because of anything, but because when they feel that you have you love them, you care for them. And this is more important, my dear brothers and sisters, that we, as we go out, we don't look at ourselves as the one who knows everything. Sometimes as a pastor, when I told the woman, I cannot answer your question, I need to pray. And she said, wow, I like that answer. So God bless us. This story about the Syrophoenician woman is such a beautiful context of our lesson and it's wonderful that the one who put the lesson together went back to this experience of jesus and this woman if you look up matthew chapter 15 there's a contention about traditions and washing of hands and and minor points that they're accusing the disciples of and i see jesus a little bit frustrated if, I don't think he was frustrated, but I, I interpret it that way a little bit because he was in Capernaum and he walked 35 miles approximately from there with all his disciples 
just to meet this woman and then tell her it's not meat for me to give the crumb to uh, to to, uh, to get free, feed the dogs but the woman says <laughs> she accepts the reproof she didn't murmur or complain she said but the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table and jesus is teaching a lesson to his disciples how long would it take you to walk 35 miles joe are, are you ready for the walk yeah i need strength yeah this is important to prepare also yeah so we we look at this uh, situation where jesus is taking all these disciples there to meet this woman to show them what that his love is not prescribed by race or nation that all who were uh, willing should be uh, um, there i consider this the joseph act because it says of joseph the boughs hang over the wall and so we when we live in one place and we have a, per, a tree from some a neighbor and they and the boughs are over the wall i think we have the right to pick the fruit if they're not going to prune it so we have a right to eat it and so this woman was doing that and not only that it tells us that Jesus came to break down the middle wall of partition between us. And it wasn't time yet because the time of the Jews was still existing, but they got crumbs. And this was one of the crumbs that there was gotten. And we see also in the time of Jesus, there were those who were also blessed uh, and touched by his ministry who were not among the Jews. Although Jesus did said when they sent them out, go none to none, but those of the household of, of, of Israel. But now let's come back to the very end of our lesson. What is the point? It's mentioned several times in the lesson, quoting Paul and Book of Romans and, and Christ, also in the Gospels, that we are not to work for reward, but we're not to work for money. We're to work for love. And Christ warned the disciples who had been first called to follow him, lest the same evil should be cherished among them. He saw that the weakness, the curse of the church would be a spirit of self-righteousness. Men would think they could do something toward earning a place in the kingdom of heaven. And they would imagine that when they had made certain advancement, the Lord would come in to help them. Did you hear what it says? It's that theory that I'll do my best, Christ will make up the rest. Brothers and sisters, Christ has already made it all up. And it's ours to follow after him and praise his name. I was ministering to one person recently, and I told them, and they were really surprised that I just said something that we should all know. When we take the glory, God stopped working. So let's give him all the glory and all the praise, because he has made provision for all of us in all things. Thank you, Brother Joel, for being with us, for uh, taking the time and the patience uh, to work with this lesson so precious it should be in our side. What do you have in closing? And when you make your comments, give us... No, brother, I... Prayer. Uh, I believe that we, we take the glory because we feel that we were always good Catholics, that's why God brought us to the, to the, to the uh, Protestant. And when then people say, I'm, I was a good missionary in the Protestant, that's why the Lord take me and made me an Adventist. And now because I was bringing a lot of souls, I became a reformer and I became a pastor. But I have seen that in the Old Testament, the Lord uses Joseph. He was very young. He uses also uh, same well, a very small child, and they rely upon the Lord. They tell the Lord, speak, Lord, for the servant hear it. The danger if we, <laughs> according to the workers in the vineyard, if we believe too much in our uh, literary knowledge and education that we think self-righteous, I need, in, in this church, if I'm not here, this will fall. This is not true. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. It is the Lord that prepares and cultivates the ground. The Lord is the one that gives conversion, our work. 
is to continue the love that God has given us and to become a channel in which the Lord's grace can pass to all men. Amen. Pray that that is so, brother. Thank you for those words. Let's have a closing prayer. Our dear God, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this great privilege, Lord, to be a part of your God's wonderful people. We have a world to save, but Lord, we don't have any strength of our own. Our knowledge is limited, but we want, Lord, to appreciate your great love to us. And that love, we are ready, Lord, that you can help us, guide us, teach, touch our lips, change our hearts, give us a clear mind, Lord. We owe everything from you. I pray that you bless your people around the world. That as, that as we go out, Lord, it is not us but Christ in us. Bless my dear pastor, Brother Larry, and bless him also. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And God bless you too, Brother Joel. And thank you for being with us today. And we thank also Brother Gary and Brother Adine for helping us with this um, message and getting it out to the people. Please join us next week when we will study uh, the grace of God with the lesson of the 10 virgins with Sister Margie Seeley, Seeley, General Conference Education Leader. Until then, God bless you. Blessed Sabbath day. And like we said, give all glory to God. He that hath ears, let him hear is our prayer in your in your hearing amen thank you